Video games have been through tons and tons of different trends through the years. Some have stuck around while others have not. Hi folks, it's Falcon and today on Game Ranks, 10 features that have completely disappeared from video games. Starting off with number 10, fancy boxes with bonus stuff. As total physical game sales get lower and lower every year, we can't help but feel a little nostalgic about game boxes, like the actual box that a physical disc, CD, or cartridge came in. And yeah, nowadays those physical pieces of media feel like maybe more of a hassle than anything else. Getting a physical game on release day can be a total crapshoot depending on where you live, and a lot of the time the full game isn't even on the disc anymore. And don't forget about those day one patches too. Now obviously that wasn't always the case. Before digital became the de facto way to get a game, the only way to get it was physically, and the further you go back, the more interesting things developers and publishers would do to try to get player attention. Like PC game boxes used to be these huge, elaborate things that took up a ton of shelf space in a way that kind of resembled books, except for they would even like have unusual shapes to really get a potential player's attention. But probably the coolest thing games would do was include a couple of extra things in the box. Some bonus extras known as uh, feelies. Of course, we still get a few games that give you some stuff when you buy them, like special editions are huge. But the difference is that those cost more, sometimes a lot more. Well, way back when, many games came in with free bonus stuff just to be like, hey, this game's worth it. Like the Civilization games are really good about that. They would regularly come with these gigantic 250 page manuals and poster sized reference charts. Just sort of really cool physical objects that grounded the game in something real. It wasn't just PC games with cool bonus stuff either. The US release of Earthbound had an oversized box that contained the entire strategy guide that was presented like an in-universe travel guide. It's like a perfect example of what I just talked about. It's just this awesome thing that just flipped through for fun. Feelies aren't gone entirely with games. There's an entire marketplace of physical game releases that usually include some little bonuses with them. But for major game publishers, if you buy a game, pretty much all you're gonna get is a disc and an empty plastic case. Half the time they don't even bother with the black and white inserts anymore. They just don't care. And number nine is cheat codes and passwords. With the rise of integrated multiplayer achievements and DLC, cheats and passwords don't have the kind of value they once did. It's understandable that a lot of games don't have them. Like if you're playing multiplayer, you're gonna want a fair game, for instance. Obviously, people do still cheat online, but a developer isn't going to intentionally put a cheat in that breaks the careful balance of their game. Like, that's entirely easy to get. Uh, it's a little less understandable when game makers do things like make it so you can pay to unlock stuff in a game. That's basically a cheat code you're paying for, and, and that sucks. But it used to just be a common thing that if you bought a game, you could cheat to your heart's content when you're alone in your house having a fun time. You could put in a code, skip a level, activate god mode, whatever you want to do, you just do it. Now if you just screw around in a game and cheat, you're mostly out of luck. You'd think with so many developers talking about accessibility, they'd put in a cheats menu for people who want it, but I guess there's just too much money on the table for that. Now, there are a few holdouts of course. The recent LEGO Star Wars game has a full-blown cheats menu and even a password system. Of course, you don't just get it right from the start. You have to earn the cheats rather than just use them, but that's something more along the lines of the Nintendo 64 era, and it's something at least. And number eight is lives. Now, obviously when you're making a list about features that are disappearing from games, it's not necessarily all gonna be good features. Some people are gonna hate some of these features. Some are gonna like them, but it's pretty clear the whole classic live system is kind of going the way of the dodo and being replaced with auto saves. Like you know about lives. You had a little number, when you die, you lose one. And if you run out, you gotta restart the level. That's a life and many players think that it's a punishing and unfun mechanic that we need to move on from. It's basically a holdover from arcades in order for arcades to make money, a single quarter can't just let you play the game forever. So a quarter allots you a certain amount of lives. If you run out of those lives, you have to put another quarter. It's understandable in that business model, but maybe not so much outside of that business model. But for an example of it going away, I want to just note the Sonic Origins collection. It's the first four Sonic games that completely eliminates lives from the standard game mode. Like when I think of lives, the first games I think of are like Mario and Sonic, and I'm old enough to remember Mario in the arcade, but their newest games are mostly lives free. If you die in Mario Odyssey, you lose a few coins and that's it. Even Mario is ditching that system. Of course, there's plenty of self-consciously retro indie games that still 
still use lives, but a lot of games are trying something different. Moving on to a less punishing system where you just lose some resources when you die and you never lose all of your progress. Now there are people who do like the tension that a live system brings to the game, but for the most part it seems like games are moving away from it. Who knows, maybe in a few years they'll start missing it and implementing it as a feature you can earn or something. At number 7 is Avatars and Avatar Rewards. Now, I, this is one that's absolutely dead and buried. Um, do you even remember this whole thing? On the Xbox 360, they introduced these little avatars right around the time the Nintendo Miis were getting popular. And as a cool little bonus, they made it so certain costume pieces could actually be earned by completing achievements in specific games. Like, you could get a little unique helmet from Halo Reach by clearing a campaign mission on Legendary without dying. You could get Marcus's do-rag from Gears 3 by beating the campaign. And once you unlock them you could dress up your avatar with them and that was a pretty cool little bonus it was also more satisfying than an achievement to some extent at least with some of them you get a sombrero from red dead by shooting someone's hat off you get a companion cube by beating portal 2 like there was a lot of really cool stuff you could add to your character and at the end of the day you couldn't really do anything with them it's just kind of a just fun little visual bonus the whole concept of the avatars basically died out though it's almost completely gone from the xbox dashboard apparently there's some way to still view them but I, I don't know what it is and Nintendo discontinued the me channel there are still me's that show up in certain games but as a way to represent your online identity the whole feature really isn't around anymore avatars were okay but the rewards you could get around them were particularly fun even if only a few games ever really took advantage of it at number six is instant death QTEs. Uh, short for quick time events, these things seem to be slowly disappearing from the gaming landscape. First coined in Shenmue, they kind of amount to cutscenes where you have to press a flashing button display it on the screen to avoid failure or death. For a while, it seemed like every other game had some form of QTE in them, and it really got out of hand during the Xbox 360 PS3 era. Now, some people really hate these mechanics, and we're very vocal about it. Even with all that hate, though, it took developers a long time to finally phase that out. And there are still plenty of games with context actions, a kind of evolved version of it that's way less irritating, and in some cases actually good. But for the most part, the traditional QTE is pretty much over. So by traditional, we mean the ones where you have to press the button or you die, like in Resident Evil 4 or the Tomb Raider reboot, where they're filled with these kinds of death traps. And while these are both great games, the QTEs can kind of be a disruption as you're trying to go through them. I will say there's something amusing about a QTE that is executed well, like when the failure is particularly amusing and the load time isn't a problem. I don't really have an issue with them. That terrible Spider-Man 3 game would be completely forgotten if not for its hilarious QTE fail animations, for example. And it is impossible not to mention the amazing sequence from Heavy Rain where you can fail repeatedly during the course of a chase scene, and it is genuinely one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. Most games these days are a lot less punishing about quick time events, even if they have them, and that's probably for the best. It's fun to watch a fail compilation on YouTube, but it's less funny when you're the one who's actually trying to play it. And number five is pack-in demos. Remember when games would come with more games? Of course, these days the pack-in demo is basically unnecessary because as long as you have an internet connection, you can download a demo. But there was something fun about opening up a game and finding out all the demos it came with. PlayStation, for instance, had awesome demo discs. And if you had a PC back in the day, those classic PC gamer demo discs were an amazing treasure trove of stuff. Um, if you were a kid with a very low income like myself, you weren't buying those magazines for the magazines. You were buying them for the demo discs. Well, it's funny to think about nowadays, but there were only certain games that everybody bought just to get the demo. Like, people bought Crackdown just to get the Halo 3 beta. People bought Zone of Enders probably specifically to get the Metal Gear Solid 2 demo. That's probably why it sold as many copies as it did. One awesome demo came packed in with Spyro 3. Like, you could play a limited version of Crash Bash on it, but with a code, you could access most of the entire game. You basically got two games in one. And even though Crash Bash isn't the best game in the series, pretty great for freebie. Demos even are seeing a bit of a resurgence lately, so the very concept of the game demo isn't something that's disappeared entirely. But demos packaged with other games, yeah, there's not really a reason for game makers to do it, but it is fun to think about all of the stuff that we got from that.
And number four is instant fail stealth sections. It seems like almost every game these days has some kind of rudimentary stealth mechanic. So stealth itself is a concept that's probably never gonna disappear from games. And I think that's good. What is disappearing though, is that all these annoying instant fail stealth sections in games that everybody hates, unlike lives or even QTEs, this is one thing I don't think that anybody's really gonna mourn. These sections were the worst parts of their games and rightfully deserve to go into the dustbin of gaming history. For a while, they were everywhere too. Probably the most recent example was on the PS4 Spider-Man game during the Miles Morales, Mary Jane sequences, but those were so easy they weren't really that much of a problem. The really bad ones were from games in the like PS2, Xbox era and the PS3, Xbox 360 era. Early Assassin's Creed loved these things, with tailing missions being some of the most boring and tedious of all of them. So many games snuck in stealth sections that really didn't need them, like the PS2 Hulk movie game where it feels like half the game you spend sneaking around a boring military base as Ruth's Banner, rather than doing the thing that you're playing the game for, you know, smashing stuff as the Hulk. Not even adventure games could escape these awful segments. Uh, Indigo Prophecy slash Fahrenheit probably had one of the worst of all time, where your little kid's trying to sneak into a military base, uh, which is just a silly scenario anyways. But David Cage has committed many gaming crimes over the years. This terrible stealth section, probably chief among those. These days being caught usually means you have to kill the guys who saw you rather than getting a game over. And in general, stealth is just a lot better after a couple decades decades of developing it as a standard mechanic. It's certainly not all perfect, but it's gotten a lot better. And number three is local and online players together. Remember when you could play locally and online at the same time? Like, it wasn't common, but it was nice to have when you had friends over. For whatever reason, there's been much less games recently with split screen functionality, and that sucks. More options are always better when it comes to multiplayer, and couch co-op and couch competitive are just incredibly fun ways to have, like, your friends over over the weekend and kill some time. Like, the few games that still do it like Mario Kart 8 are usually the premier couch type party games, but most multiplayer games don't even let you play in split screen, let alone online at the same time. As much as people complain about the Call of Duty franchise, it, it, it's gotta be said that at least they still offer pretty decent split screen options. It sucks they eventually cut split screen online, but at least you can play with your friends locally if you choose to, even if it's a little more limited. I don't know, being able to play games online with local friends at the same time is a really nice thing. Like you can coordinate with each other in the way that you would over a chat except for there's the in-person I'm hanging out with my friends aspect to it that is just a ton of fun like you can order a pizza together and a two liter of Mountain Dew and just devour a whole bag of Oreos that is a weekend and number two is discs that doubled as soundtracks. Kind of a secret thing, but some people who were playing games back during the fifth generation of consoles definitely remember, well, some probably don't even know about it, but certain disc-based games, you could actually put in a CD player and listen to their soundtrack. Now, it wasn't every game, it depended on the sound format, but games like Twisted Metal 4, Rainbow Six, you open that thing in the PlayStation BIOS or put them in a CD player, you could listen to the soundtrack right there. It wasn't just PlayStation games either, you could do it with Sega CD and Saturn games, some of them at least, there were some PC games as well. I distinctly remember listening to Half-Life 1 soundtrack on the game CD. An awesome little bonus. I also remember when Rayman first came out. That was one I listened to a lot because it had a really different, interesting soundtrack. At that point in time, platformers all had kind of chiptune type music, and it was among the first that had a more expansive and seamless sounding soundtrack. Very crisp and well executed. Obviously, the whole CD market's dead and buried, so this little feature of some games is long dead. Listening to a game soundtrack is pretty much easier than ever now, but there was something kind of cool to being able to use your game disc in an unexpected way. And finally, at number one is interactive loading screens, or even mini games on loading screens. Like the last thing players want to see is a loading screen. Next gen streaming technology combined with solid state drives have almost made loading screens a thing of the past. So we're seeing less and less of this these days. And a lot of the time we even just see a loading screen or something for a split second. That's great. That obviously wasn't always the case though. For some older games, it could take several minutes to load a game. 
and even games with shorter loading screens tended to have them all over the place to compensate. I don't think anybody's particularly sad to see this go, but with the loss of loading screens comes a loss of a pretty cool but rare thing that some developers would do, like give you something to do while the game loads. Usually with something kind of basic like shooting and slashing the loading screens on Devil May Cry, but some games were a little more creative like in Bayonetta where you could practice combos on the loading screens. It was actually a way that I got better at playing platinum games type games. Dragon Ball Z Budokai 3 had some weird little mini games you could do during loading screens. Probably the most impressive one was from Tekken 5, where for some reason you could play the 1991 arcade shooter Starblade while the game loaded. One reason this feature was so rare was because Namco apparently put a patent on it, so other publishers would have to pay them if they wanted to include this feature. Ignoring the absurdity of patenting a gameplay concept like that, the patent expired in 2015 and nobody really cared. There are about a dozen and articles online celebrating the fact Namco's iron grip on the loading screen minigame was finally over, but how many games actually added one after 2015? I can't really even think of any, because the loading screen was already on its way out by then. If there's no more or just significantly fewer and shorter loading screens, it's kind of hard to put minigames in them, you know? And that's all for today. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. Best way to see them first is a course of subscription, so click subscribe. Don't forget to enable notifications and as always thank you very much for watching this one i'm falcon you can follow me on twitter falcon the hero we'll see you next time right here on game ranks